you have your Bibles, kindly turn with me to the book of Genesis chapter 5. I think this is our ninth week in the book of Genesis. So if you would kindly turn with me to, the, to chapter 5 of Genesis. Chances are you have probably never heard a sermon on this chapter. You have never heard a teaching on Genesis chapter 5. You probably have read it in your daily reading of the Bible, but uh, very little chance that you've actually heard a sermon or even a, even a sermon at a funeral because there's one phrase that is repeated over and over again, and he died. In spite of that phrase, you've never heard this um, chapter being taught on or expounded on um, ever before. So, and if you have, kindly let me know at the end of the study, I'll be interested in, and I'll, I, I'll be interested to know some of the in insights that you have on this chapter. And the reason is because it's a genealogy. And often when we come across genealogies, we think it's boring. And even sometimes when we're just reading it, we'll skip it because we know it's just a bunch of names. This person fathered, this person, this person begat, this person. And very often we skip uh, genealogies, but they are important. And this one in particular serves as a bridge. And we all know that a bridge is important, even in when we go from one place to another, a bridge serves as a connection between two places. It might connect uh, two pieces of land over sea, or it basically increases connectivity and connects you to some place that would otherwise be inaccessible. So a bridge is important and that's what Genesis chapter five is. It's a bridge and it's like as if Moses presses the fast forward button over here because he wants to go from God, the creator, the, the, the whole of creation, the creation of Adam and Eve in Genesis two, the create or not the creation, the, the children that uh, Adam and Eve had, Cain and Abel, we know that Cain murdered Abel according to Genesis chapter four. From all those people, from those four people, from the birth of Seth, now Adam wants to fast forward from Seth down to Noah. And the person that he's going to uh, explain or talk about to us in great detail is Noah. But in between, he just wants to wants us to realize that he's giving us a, a historical account. I mean, this account is historically reliable. It's not just some, you know, um, allegorized account. Adam is a real person and he stands shoulder to shoulder with all the persons, all the people that are mentioned in Genesis chapter 5. All are real people and we have to take the account literally. And so that's what Moses does over here. It's like a chain. I think 11 figures are mentioned over here uh, and um, 10 generations are mentioned. And that phrase that um, you hear that refrain, and he died, it's mentioned about eight times. It's mentioned eight times because Enoch did not die. He was taken up. He was caught away to be with the Lord says the Bible says Enoch walked with the Lord and then he was not. So God took him, God snatched him away. So he didn't die. And Noah's death is also not mentioned over here because it's mentioned later in Genesis chapter nine. And so it serves as a bridge. It serves as a chain. It also serves as an obituary to remind us about the frailty of life. I like what uh, Spurgeon said about this phrase, and he died. I've written it down. Let me read it for you. He said, have you never heard of the one who read as the lesson for the Sabbath day, that long chapter of names wherein it is written that each of the patriarchs lived so many hundred years and he died. Thus, it ends with a notice of the long life of Methuselah and he died. The repetition of the words, and he died, woke the thoughtless hearer to a sense of his own mortality and leads to his coming to Christ. So Spurgeon says that that repetition, that phrase, that refrain, and he died, wakes the, or, yeah, wakes the, the thoughtless reader, the person who is sleepy, or um, lethargic, spiritually speaking, wakes them up and leads them to coming to Christ. It, it causes them to think of the 
frailty of life, that life is like a vapor, the transitoriness of life. And sometimes we don't realize the importance of genealogies, but I like this one story. I'm not 100% sure if it's a true story, but I, the story is very meaningful. Cannot find the source of this story, but a story is told that uh, there was this one Bible translator who went to um, this uh, tribal group and he was trying to translate the gospel so that they could read the gospels in their own language. And um, as he was translating Matthew and Luke, we know that Matthew and Luke have genealogies mentioned in the beginning. He skipped over them and he thought he'll get to the good stuff, you know, all the, to the life of Jesus, the temptation of Jesus, the things that Jesus said and taught both in Matthew and Luke. And he thought at the end of his translation, he will add, you know, just as a side note, oh, by the way, the genealogy is also mentioned here at the beginning. So the tribal people read those books. And then when they finally came to the genealogy at the end, they, they exclaimed to him and they said, oh, we, we didn't know it was a real person that we were reading out. We thought this was a work of fiction. We thought we we're reading about some imaginary hero who came and lived this life, this sinless life, who died and was Now, because we read, read the genealogy, we realize this is a real person who really lived. He's a historical figure. And I, I don't know whether that story is true or not, but it tells you the importance of genealogies and it establishes the credibility of the text that we're looking at. So the interesting story, now how did Moses get this? Two, two answers. One is he could have accessed previously recorded um, narratives of this or previously uh, recorded books of all these people, these ancestors, that is one possibility. The second is direct revelation from God. We don't know what it is. Maybe God directly revealed this to Moses as he wrote the book of Genesis, or he had um, access to all, uh, all the records that were preserved down through the centuries. So James Usher, he was, he was a bishop, an Irish bishop in the 16th century, very famous bishop. He actually worked on uh, chronology and according to his chronology, he says that he, he has measured all these gene uh, genealogies. He's calculated the different lifespans of people. And according to him, the world came into existence or was created by God in 4004 BC. So it's about 6,000 years now. It's 4004 BC. And he even is even more specific and he says it was created on October 22nd at about 6 p.m. So it's a very audacious claim to be that precise as to when the earth was created. But that's what he says. I actually have I have a copy of his book about uh, the annals of time or something like that, where he you have this long chronology and he lifts, uh, lists the different uh, lifespans of people and what happened when. So um, this will be this this chronology of James Asher and this view that our earth is just about 6,000 years old, maybe six to 10,000 years old, uh, is often at odds with science and many, many things that scientists believe. And if you say this, if you mention this in the scientific community, they'll often laugh at you and say, no, the world uh, has plenty of evidence that it's actually billions and billions of years old. And many people say about 14.6, 14.8 billion years old right now. So, one thing to think about this, you know, about this, this contradiction or this apparent, apparent contradiction, this alleged contradiction is this, that when Adam was born, uh, obviously on day one, he was one day old, but he was not born as a newborn baby. We all, we all understand that. We all know that when God created Adam, he wasn't a small newborn baby, like how you see them in the hospital or the delivery rooms today. He was a fully grown man, maybe at the age of, maybe maybe uh, how a 20-year-old would look to us today or a 25-year-old or a 30-year-old. He's a fully grown man, a fully develop, uh, developed man. So, but he was still on day one when God created, he was still only one day old. So, he was created with maturity. He was uh, created with apparent age instilled in him. He looked older even on day one. He looked much older than 
you know, what a baby would look on the first day it was born, on the second day it was born. And so I think it's the same also when you read the, when you read the Genesis account in chapter one, it's the same thing when it comes to the creation of trees and birds and not, none of them started from scratch. None of them started off as a little baby or the tree or the plant as a little sapling or something. It was all created with maturity. And so the same thing could be said of the earth which is why many people today believe that the earth is billions and billions of years old, because it does show the signs of age, but it's not necessarily that old. It could be six to 10,000 years. Old. However, one thing is important is you have good faithful believers on both sides of this debate. You can have an old earth creationist also who is a firm believer in the Lord Jesus. I don't think that is a contradiction or they're heretical or something. I will disagree with anybody who says that, but doesn't mean that you cannot believe being an old earth creationist. However, even they have to believe that at some point, the Bible will be at odds with science. For example, the resurrection. Science, science clearly tells you that a dead person cannot come back to life. Now, they cannot hold to science over there and say, so if science says a dead person cannot come back to life, then the resurrection is not true. So at some point, even they have to understand and accept that the bible is at odds with science we take it a little further and we say that is the new earth creationists will say no we believe in spite of all the evidence out there that shows you that the world is supposedly very old we believe the bible says if you calculate all it, it it's roughly about six thousand years old so it, so on both sides of this debate you can have uh, bible believing christians so um, those are some of the things that we ought to keep in mind when we are looking at Genesis chapter 5. Another thing would be the long lifespan of people who lived, who are mentioned over here in Genesis chapter 5. Um, the, young, the, the guy to live the least in Genesis chapter 5, the least number of years, is uh, Enoch, 365 years. And then he doesn't die, he's just taken up by the Lord. The guy who lived the longest was Methuselah. And he lived 969 years. So some people say this is figurative. This is not literal age. Some people will say that this, these, these years, you know, one decade, 10 years should be actually one month. These people were inflating the numbers or they were exaggerating or symbol, symbolism is used in the Bible and so on and so forth. But I do think it's literal because if you say that, if you take that theory where some people believe that, you know, one decade is... Uh, uh, sorry, yeah, one decade, that's 10 years is one month, then then it's, then it's if you calculate and if you do the calculation, then Enoch was only six and a half months when he had Methuselah, which is not possible. So I think it's literal years. Um, uh, the reason that they lived so long as we spoke earlier is because the gene pool was not degenerative. It was not corrupted as it is now. So Adam would have been biologically superior. Adam and his descendants, his grand children his progeny would have been biologically superior to each one of us today they would have had stronger immune systems and stronger organs and all those kind of things stronger muscles and so on so there was another reason why when we were looking at the, the in the first few weeks of genesis another reason why uh, we can hold to the fact that they lived much longer what was the reason that contributed to their longevity uh, in Genesis chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, on day 2 of creation, it talks about a firmament or a water canopy or a water blanket, water vapor that surrounded the earth, that covered the earth, which ensured there were no polarized caps and there was no hurricanes. And it also very importantly filtered out all the harmful UV rays, which, which contributed to their long life. Today, that's because of many of those harmful UV rays that we don't have very long lives. We don't live very long lives. Of course, all the, the gen genetic mutation and all those things are there. But this was one of those reasons that people lived much longer before the flood. After the flood, that, that the water canopy broke open and that's what caused the flood. So that is one of the reasons. And uh, some people, again, believe, see, when, when, when we talk about these people, people's ages being literal, some people say, then why... Was Abraham so surprised that he could have a son at the age of 100 in Genesis 17? He laughs and says, can a man of my age uh, have, a, have a son? And can Sarah, who's 90 years old, possibly 10 years younger than Abraham, can, can we have a son when God promised them a son through them? I think uh, he there was genuinely questioning his own um, strength, his own vitality, 
and also uh, considering or taking into consideration Sarah's infertility because if she was married at the average age that a woman would get married during their time, it would have been about 16 to 18 years old. That's how young they got married back then. So when God is making this promise, they were 90 years old. So, and the Bible says Sarah was a beautiful woman. So it wasn't for lack of love or lack of attraction or something like that. The fact is that they were trying for many years and they were unable to have children. And so that's what causes him to express that sentiment. Can a man of my age, woman of her age, have a child, have a child at this age? And so they found it a little bit challenging to believe in the promise of God. And we know that they tried through uh, Hagar and so on. So that's why they, he exclaims, it's not because his own father, Terah, had a son at the age of 130. His uh, ancestor, Shem, I think 100 years old he had. So some people wonder, why does he exclaim that his own his own uh, grandpa, uh, grandparents and all the people, his ancestors had children so late. So why was he so surprised when God made him that promise? It's because of his own life, his own experience. That's the reason he makes that um, exclamation. So um, we'll read we'll read a few verses here. Now we'll get into the chapter a little bit. That's all a little bit of background because we'll go quickly through this chapter. This is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them. So when they were created, they were created in the image, in the likeness of God. We talked about the image of God in previous studies. He created them with two genders, very important, male and female. Didn't create them male and male or female and female. He created them male and female. And that's how it's always been male and female. Today, all those things are sadly debated. But uh, from the beginning, even Jesus, when he was talking to the Pharisees, I think Matthew 19, he says, from the beginning, they were created male and female, referen uh, referencing this text and the previous text that um, God created uh, human beings, male and female. He blessed them and he named them Adam. That's the literal word, Adam. He named them mankind, humankind, when they were created. Then it says, when Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. So there's something, there's a change here if you're a careful observer. First, Adam is created in the image of God, but now we're told that Seth, who Adam fathered, is created in his own likeness, in his own image. So what happened over here? It, it's a way of saying that now the image of God is marred. When Adam and Eve were created, the image was God's perfect image. They were carriers of, they were representatives of God and they were created in an innocent state. But now Seth is now born with the sinful nature. Sin had come and Adam had brought in sin and death and, and death spread to all mankind according to Romans 5. And so now when Seth is conceived, when Seth is born, he is born with this sinful nature. Sin is inherent um, to, to Seth. So that's what it means say that now Seth is born in Adam's likeness. It doesn't mean that we don't have the image of God within us as human beings. Every human being, regardless of their faith or worldview, has the image of God, except it's tarnished, except it's marred now. And in a sense, we have in that sense, we have Adam's image until we are born again and until we are reconciled. We have Adam's image. We are made in his likeness until we believe in the second Adam or the last Adam. So <clears throat> Verses 4 says, the days of Adam after he fathered Seth were 800 years and he had other sons and daughters. So he had a lot of sons and daughters and um, the days that, that he was the father of Seth was 800 years. That's all the days that Adam lived were 930 years. So Adam lived to the ripe old age of 930. And then you have the, the start of this phrase, this refrain, and he died hebrews chapter 9 says it is appointed for man to die once and after that the judgment so you hear that phrase again and that's why you know somebody once said your heartbeat sounds a little bit morbid but you have to think about it you know because um yeah i'll just i'll just read this quote it just says your heartbeat is a drum beat to your own funeral eventually, right? We're all headed towards our own death. That is the truth. It may not be a very pleasant truth. And some people like to like not to think about death and try to put it away as much as possible. But the truth is when we think about death is when you know, somebody said, there's a famous quote where somebody said, you really, yeah, you nobody is ready to live until you're ready to die. That in the, in, in the sense that, 
only when you realize the frailty and the brevity of your own life will you really begin to live in light of eternity and will you really start making eternal investments not just earthly investments um while there may, might be a place for all that we begin to live for eternity in light of eternity which is why moses in the oldest psalm that we have in the collection of psalm psalms 9012 says uh teach me to understand the brevity of life so that i gain a heart of wisdom teach me to understand that my my days are numbered that they are short that man is like a vapor it's fleeting that vapor is fleeting so let me gain a heart of wisdom how i should live each day how i should maximize each day for the glory of god and live in light of eternity jonathan edwards one of the greatest preachers to have ever lived uh when he was 18 years old he became a pastor so at the age of 18 he became an interim pastor in the city of new york he took over a scottish presbyterian church that just um encountered a split and during that age that young age of 18 he made about 70 resolutions and he said this is the trajectory this is the direction that i want my life to go and i'm going to make 70 uh, resolutions sort of like a moral compass to help him through his life of resolutions that he would constantly meditate on drawn from scripture so in those resolutions here is resolution number 9 because it neatly ties into what we were just talking about the brevity of life and how we have to often meditate and think about the fact that all of us are going to die eventually we're going to die and so we must try and maximize the life that god has given us resolution number 9 he says resolve to think much on all occasions of my own dying and of the common circumstances which attend death so edwards had prepared to enter his life uh, sorry he had prepared his entire life for the, for his own death he was think he said i must think often about my own death so that it 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 creates in me that sense of urgency that sense where okay i need to, okay i'm having this interaction with this person let it be meaningful I, i'm having this unforgiveness i'm harboring this resentment this bitterness in my heart let me forgive how long are we going to be how long are we going to be harboring that over that grudge over let me forgive let me make this moment if i if i'm talking to a person where i would normally be rude or i say i need to put them in my in their place so so that i think okay my life is short let me be nice let me be kind to people because i'm not here very long so let me maximize my life and let me live in the spirit and not in the flesh let me have the mind of the spirit and not of the flesh so that's what edwards talks about it he died as a third president a uh, president of princeton university with both his daughters by his side and his wife was actually just um, finishing packing up where he had ministered and he was in uh, he was in the north of new york he was ministering to some indian people so he, it was like a it was like a he was towards the end of life he was somewhat of a missionary and so as he died he said i have no regrets you know i i live my life to the fullest so was somebody who really tried to do his best one of the greatest preachers that ever lived and it, it didn't happen by accident he was very deliberate about it we read his resolution resolution number 9 he says i i must constantly think not in a sense where we are bogged down by it and we become depressed or something just so that we understand just as moses said teach me to understand the brevity of my life so that i gain a heart of wisdom every single day counts i shouldn't waste a single day when it comes to relationships when it comes to sharing the gospel when it comes to putting a smile on god's face john chapter 9 verses 4 jesus himself said this again connected to this very same topic we must work he's talking to the disciples he says we must work the works of him who sent me night is coming when no man can work and night over here is a metaphor for death jesus himself knew that he had limited time on this earth to do the work to do his father's bidding to do his father's will the sun was setting so to speak on on the life of jesus and he was going to head towards golgotha he was going to head towards his own crucifixion and so he says that i must come to do the work that my father sent me and he he includes the disciples in that and that's that's true of all of us so let's read on over here and, and look at a couple uh, more verses when seth that lived seth is the replacement of Abel the one that Cain killed that's what Eve said when Seth was born 
When Seth had lived 105 years, he fathered Enosh. Seth lived after he fathered Enosh 807 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Seth were 902. So Adam was 930, Seth was 912. And again, that phrase, and he died. When Enosh had lived 90 years, he fathered Kenan. Enosh lived after he fathered Kenan 815 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enosh were 905 and he died. In the one, there's this one author who um, estimates the historian and he just calculates and says, even if Adam saw half the people and he saw his children's children, he would have already seen thousands and thousands of people. They were quickly, I mean, everybody, they, it was quick multiplication of it. He would have seen thousands and thousands of people. Adam himself in his own lifetime would have seen tens of thousands of his own descendants. So, and he dies. Now, when Kenan had lived 70 years, he fathered Mahalalil. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but that's how it looks like. Some people say Mahalil or something like that. So, Mahalalil. Canaan lived after he fathered Mahalalel 840 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Canaan were 910 years and he died. The, the name Mahalalel, or however it's pronounced, means praise of God or praise to God. So, very possible that um, Canaan over here named his son that because he believed, because he was a believer, because he at some point placed his faith in God. So it's interesting to note because in Genesis chapter 6, we're told that the world had become increasingly evil and the thoughts of man were very corrupt. His deeds were very vile and uh, his depravity was at an all-time high. It says every thought was perpetually evil, continuously evil. So that means man has started this downward spiral into depravity and uh, just being malevolent and being very evil and figuring out more and more ways to sin. There we saw in the beginning, it was only that temptation to trust the reliability of what did God really say in the, in the garden. But now they, they're being very innovative when it comes to finding out new methods of sinning. And by the time you come to Genesis 6, which is the next chapter, we're told the whole of mankind is corrupt and they're extremely evil, extremely nefarious their deeds are. So it's interesting to note that they still continue to have children, even in that culture, which is extremely evil, because today sometimes you hear this explanation where people will reason, parents will reason and say, oh, the world is too evil. I, I'm very hesitant about having a child, introducing a child, a newborn child into this corrupt society. What will happen to that child? What if that child strays away, wanders away? And all those dangers are possible. And there's potential for all that. But the point is they still had, there was always a faithful remnant. They still trusted God. You know, Psalms 127 says that children uh, are like arrows. And blesses is man whose quiver is full of them. Why? Because a warrior shoots an arrow and an arrow goes to a place where the warrior cannot go to. And it continues to carry on the attack beyond his reach. So it's, it's helpful. So children can go to places that parents cannot go and cannot reach. And if they, they are saved, if you train up a child and, um, you know, you train up a child in the way he should go or she should go, in the end, he will not depart or she will not depart from what you train them up to be. And of course, that is a general promise not to be taken literally all the time. But um, it's interesting to think about if you have a child, a person has a child, that's one more person in heaven. That is one more person representing God on earth. One more person, one more carrier of the great commission, possibly one more person who carries the glory of God, reflects the image of God. Um, somebody who experiences reconciliation, redemption. So it is one more soldier in the army of God. And so that's why it, it's always, you know, children are a heritage from the Lord, again, Psalmist says. So even in this corrupt generation, they continue to have children. And here one child was named, praise to God, Mahale, Mahalalel. So um, we'll read on now. When Mahalalel lived 65 years, he fathered Jared. Mahalalel lived after he fathered Jared or Jared 830 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Mahalalel were 895 years and he died. When Jared 
had lived 162 years, he fathered Enoch. Jared lived after he fathered Enoch 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Jared were 962 years and he died. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. That's a name that we're all familiar with because a lot of in Bible trivia and all we say who is the person who lived the longest. We all know Methuselah lived the longest 969 years. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. You know, I like the NASB because it says that after Methuselah was born, if you look at verses 22 in the NASB, it says, then Enoch began to walk with the Lord, which, which obviously means there was a point where he was not walking with the Lord. He was walking contrary to the Lord. So something happened when Methuselah was born, the text doesn't say, but it caused him to do a 180 degree turn, to turn over a new leaf, to repent and to trust in God. And he begins to walk with God. Again, Jonathan Edwards, who I mentioned earlier before in resolution number 62, 63, rather, he says, there can only be one Christian alive on the earth who is the most complete Christian in this generation. And he says, I will live to be that one. I will strive to be that one. Some people might say, oh, he's being prideful. But I think it's, I think it's a noble, it's a noble desire to say, I want to be that bright light. And I think that's what Enoch was in his generation where everybody was corrupt and their deeds were evil. He stood out. He was light. He was salt in that gener generation. He was like a lighthouse. And, um, so what does it mean to walk with God? It means basically to have a personal relationship. It means to walk hand in hand. You need to know the person that you're walking with. And um, it's, it's, it's basically to trust God when, when life gets complicated and trust that God would take us through that very, this very complicated or sophisticated maze that we call life. Keep looking to him. It, it, it obviously describes intimacy. That's what it means to, to walk with God, to have him by your side and speak, speak into your life, speak, speak uh, at your ear. So 300 years he walked with God. That's a long time. It's not like he had some emotional, sentimental revival that lasted for five days or so. 300 years he walked with the Lord. And so that shows you consistency. It also shows you that Philippians 1 6 is true. That God who began a good work is faithful to bring it to completion. And we can trust him that, you know, for 300 years he walked with God and um, God was faithful to his promise. So he has this relationship. So verse 22 really stands out as a diamond. It is a very, otherwise very ordinary genealogy of just people who lived and died and fathered so many children and had other sons and daughters. He really sticks out. He really stands out. He is exceptional. So Hebrews 11.5 talks about Enoch, the same person that is mentioned over here. He makes it into what is otherwise called the Hall of Fame or the Hall of Faith. And he makes it into the Hall of Faith. It says, by faith, Enoch was taken up so he would not see death. Just like Elijah, just like Jesus, when Jesus ascended later. And he was not found because God took him up. For he obtained the witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. That's why he was taken up, because he lived a life that was pleasing to God, because he walked daily with the Lord. And so it was almost like God said, he was, it is almost like he was so close to God that God told him, you're, you're, you know, today you're, you're so much more closer to my house. Might as well come home with me. Don't need to return to your house, your physical house. Or not. You can come to be with me. I mean, that's how close he was. That's how intimate he was with the Lord. Why don't you just come home to me? So he took him and that word means to seize or to snatch away. The Latin phrase is rapture. You know, he's fetched, he's taken away. When you take somebody for yourself, that's what that phrase means. So God just takes him up like that. Just like I said, Elijah was taken up in a chariot and so on. So he's the one who, he's the one who did not see death, which, is, which shows you it's a privilege that he experienced. So uh, Charles Spurgeon, in a book, he writes, he, he wrote a forward for the, for the Puritan Thomas, Thomas Watson. Puritans, basically all those people, very committed uh, to the Bible, studying the Bible very meticulously. And they were also very involved in uh, stopping or getting rid of some of the practices that still continued after the Reformation, the Catholic, the practices in the Catholic churches regarding the liturgy and everything. They helped cleanse all that, the Puritans. They're very dedicated reformers. So 
uh, he, Charles Spurgeon is writing a foreword for Thomas Watson's book called The Body of Divinity. And he talks about Watson over here and he mentions, he says that Thomas Watson died in his prayer closet. So he died while being in his prayer closet. And Charles Spurgeon says, it's possible that he did not even know he died. from. He went from glory to glory. He went from praying into glory. Possible that he did not. He, it's a slightly humorous remark where he didn't even realize he was so deep in prayer, so taken up by prayer. That he just went from glory to glory. And uh, somewhat, somewhat like Enoch, you know, except that he didn't die. Right? He was just taken from the earth uh, by God. We don't know how he took, uh, God took him. We don't know if people saw, some preachers say people might have seen him being taken up because there's nothing in the text about him being missing or, uh, you know, where people are searching or wondering. But again, we don't know if he was taken up secretly or whether people saw him being taken up. But we do know that he was taken up. Jude 14 again talks about Enoch and calls him a prophet, somebody who talked and preached about the coming judgment to come. Even in his own generation, he used to preach judgment so you can say he is a fire and brimstone preacher and a fire and brimstone preacher is a biblical uh preacher so methuselah now we'll move on to methuselah now so uh when enoch had lived 65 years he fathered methuselah so that's who we're talking about when methuselah had lived 187 years he fathered lamech Methuselah lived after he fathered Lamech 782 years and had other sons and da daughters. Thus, all the days of Methuselah were 969 years. You can think about his life insurance company, you know, what they thought of Methuselah, who lived to the ripe old age of 969 years, the longest, the, the man to live the longest. Methuselah, some people say that his name means when he dies, judgment will come. It's possible that his name means that. I don't know. I can't say for sure. But when he dies, it shall come is the meaning of his name. And um, the idea is that when he dies, judgment will come. Because when Methuselah died, the flood started. When he died, the flood, uh, the flood that Noah's family and the, the other, I think eight of them were saved through the flood. So... Uh, Methuselah's name is when he dies it shall come judgment will come and uh, what's interesting to note about Methuselah is he's the person who lived the longest which tells us what about God that God is patient he was waiting to judge the earth God cannot stand cannot tolerate sinful human beings yet when he died judgment will come methuselah but he is the one who lived the longest which shows you how forbearing god is how tolerant god is uh, you know in the new testament it says god is patient and he desires that nobody should perish so um, he was hoping that many would come to repentance and god is patient even with us today if we were to if he wasn't patient he would have wiped out the whole earth again but he promised not to and he's still continuing to be patient hoping that none will perish, that everybody will come to knowledge of his son, Jesus. And so he was forbearing. Then you have Lamech. He fathered Lamech. When Lamech was uh, had lived 182 years, he had fathered a son and uh, called his name Noah, saying, out of the ground that the Lord had has cursed, this one shall bring us relief from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. Lamech lived and he fathered Noah five ninety-five years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Lamech were seven, seven, seven years. Mm, and he died. So when Lamech uh, makes this proclamation out of the ground that the Lord is cursed, this one shall bring us relief. Well, he was hoping... Just like, just like Eve was hoping that Cain would be the deliverer. I've, I've got this man, this man child with the help of God. And she says, I got this man child literally in the Hebrew, the Lord. So there's very good uh, evidence there that Eve thought that Cain is going to be the deliverer that was promised in Genesis chapter 3. Likewise, over here, you have a similar situation where Lamech is thinking that Noah is going to be the deliverer, Noah is going to be the rescue, he's going to be the one to reverse the curse and, and uh, cause the ground to be more fruitful, yielding its fruit. But um, obviously, that did not turn out to be the case. But the le lesson that we learn over here, of course, Noah was a righteous man and he found favor in the eyes of God. But the lesson that we learn here is that throughout the generations, people were waiting. 
waiting for the coming of the Messiah, waiting for the coming of the Lord. And we today, yes, he's come one time. Um, he lived, he died for us and he was raised again on the third day. But we must also be expecting, we must also be waiting for his second coming. We must be eager and we must say, come Lord Jesus, come. So, and we, we, all, we should pray the Lord's prayer, you know, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. So, just like uh, Lamech here was there hoping that his son Noah, which means comfort or rest, would be uh, the deliverer and that he would bring them relief from the from our work and from the painful soil of our hands so um, after noah was 500 years old noah fathered shem ham and japheth so you know there's something interesting to note over here if these generations that are mentioned are consecutive generations and there's some reason to believe that they are not necessarily consecutive generations and some people hold to this side some people say no it's consecutive if they are consecutive generations and nobody is left out over here then consider this very interesting fact okay noah was uh born only 14 years after the death of seth the the son of adam Noah was born only 14 years after the death of Seth. We started off with Seth in the beginning of the genealogy. Uh, verses 6 and 7 we saw. So Seth was born around 1042 and Noah was born in 1056, which means the generations were consecutive. Noah would have talked to Seth's children and uh, would have been talking to Adam's grandchildren, which, which I think is pretty fascinating to consider, but this is only possible if the generations are consecutive. So just, a, just an interesting uh, fact. Not fact, if it's true. So Noah, um, we saw means comfort. Now the, the bridge, the bridge is complete. What Moses wanted to do is he wanted to press the password, but he wants to show us the historical reliability. He shows us this chain, the, the, this generation, these uh, generations he shows us the records of the generations. And now he's going to zoom in to Noah, which we'll look at uh, next week. He's going to spend, I think, about four chapters talking about Noah, his sons, and what they went through and what plan God had for the world and um, how he destroyed the world. We'll, we'll talk about that uh, next week. So this is Genesis chapter 5, um, the, the genealogy, the record from Adam onwards. And it's very foundational in our understanding and in our uh, belief in the reliability of scripture. So that's why God has placed it over here. So that is Genesis chapter 5.